Hi, everyone. I'm going to get us started. We'll have more people coming in, I think, as our uh, town hall rolls along. But I am Christine Rolfus. I'm the state senator for the 23rd Legislative District. I want to thank everybody for joining us. And um, we'll, we're going to start with a bunch of quick introductions, and then we'll go into the rules of the evening and how the evening is going to go. Um, and then open it up to questions, which people can pose through the chat. And some folks have sent questions ahead of time. So um, by way of introduction, I'm going to be some sort of the MC of this, but I am thrilled that my seatmates, Representative Drew Hansen and Representative Tara Simmons, are here as well. And I'm going to kick it over to Rep Hansen for a quick intro. Hey, I'm Drew Hansen. I represent 23rd Legislative District, as we all do, which is most of North Central Kitsap County. Uh, I am a ferry commuter for work and to see my folks who live on the other side of the water. So I've definitely been affected by all this. And I am going to try not to talk tonight. We did one of these for the Bremerton route a week ago. We had so many questions and we ran out of time. So the less time I talk, the more of your questions get answered, which is what you want. And we have the subject matter experts on the ferry system here who we have been talking to extensively uh, over the last six weeks and frankly, several years. But this is a chance for you all to hear from them directly. So I'm going to do my best to like not speak uh, and, you know, just listen. Okay, thanks, Drew. Tara? Good evening, everyone. Um, I am Representative Tara Simmons, also of the 23rd Legislative District and the newest um, member of our delegation. Really glad to see all of you showing up tonight. We're up to 42 people, which is great. Um, I also, you know, used the ferry to get to work for many years um, prior to the pandemic. Fortunately, I've been able to work from home. I'm very lucky um, right now, but my heart goes out to all of the constituents that reach out to us uh, almost every day who are having challenges right now and relying on this um, critical piece of our um, highway system, our marine highway, and really looking forward to um, you know, getting to the solutions and grateful for the Washington State Ferry folks who are here today um, to share their um, expertise and plans um, with all of you. And I'm also not going to talk much, thanks. Thank you, Tara. I'm going to ask John um, Bazina from Ferries to introduce himself and then turn it over to Nicole. Good evening, John Bazina, Government Relations Director for Washington State Ferries and our liaison to our 13 ferry advisory committees. Thank you, Senator. And I'm Nicole McIntosh. I'm the Chief of Staff for Washington State Ferries. Um, I've been with the ferry system for uh, 28 years now in this role for two. So. Hopefully um, I can assist John in answering questions. Thank you both. So by way of kicking this uh, town hall off, we all know you've heard from Rep Hansen and Simmons. Uh, my family also, I live on Bainbridge, we're also impacted by the service cuts. Um, but the whole system is facing challenges. We've been working with our colleagues from the San Juans all the way down to Tacoma in the legislature. To, provide input and support and critiques to the state ferry system since the beginning of the pandemic, but really heightened this summer. Um, we're having this town hall so people can get their questions, your questions addressed by the experts rather than having them necessarily go through legislators. Um, we, the three of us do not run the system. We help fund it and we provide policy guidance, um, but we're not responsible for running it. So um, we're hoping John and Nicole can really um, help us out. We know that our role as legislators will be critical in January, fighting for the investments and the service that we need. Um, but until that time, we're counting on state ferries to um, get the service restored and as quickly and fairly away as possible. This is a great turnout. We have um, over 40 folks from our region um, joining us today. We did this last week, we did a town hall like this, focusing on the Southworth and Bremerton runs. And we have a few questions that I'm sure will be similar um, that, and also questions we didn't quite get to because we had a lot of questions. Um, but as I said earlier, if you can drop your questions or comments in the Q&A box, not the chat, but the Q&A box, um, then our staff can pick them up. And if folks are watching on Facebook Live, you can leave questions in the comment sections below this video at any time. 
and both this, there'll be a recording of this and the Facebook Live um, will be something that people can tap into afterwards as well. So our staff are gonna be monitoring comments and sending us your questions. They'll be reading some of the questions so that we can, the legislators can pay attention. Um, but we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And if we can't get to everything, we'll get back to you. You can always email us and we can follow up with fairies as well. So before I kick it over to Nicole and John, I just wanted to introduce Chris West, Peter Kitchen and Zach Ellis and have them turn on their videos. Um, and Peter, if you could just quickly say what your role is and what you'll be doing tonight. Yeah, absolutely. My name is Peter Kitchen. I am the communications specialist for Representative Simmons, and I will be reading the questions as they come in tonight. Thanks for doing that. Zach? Hi, I'm the legislative assistant for Representative Simmons, and I'll be uh, reading through things as well. Okay, and Chris? Chris, you need to unmute. And I, my name is Chris West. I'm with the Senate Democratic Caucus, and um, believe it or not, I'll be uh, helping with the tech tonight. On this. <laughs> Thank you. So, John, let me turn this over to you first for um, some opening remarks. Thanks, Senator. And you know, before I start, I, I want to th thank Senator Rolfes, Representatives Hansen and Simmons, because you know, I, I think they were hiding their light under a bushel a bit. They are consistent communicators with us about the challenges you all are facing. And that didn't start this summer. It didn't start with COVID. Um, you know, Senator Rolfus and Representative Hansen for the last several years that I've been in this role and Representative Simmons since she joined the delegation, they, they pass on the comments they hear from you, the frustration, the pain, and you know they've become good partners with us in helping us understand better the, the ramifications of our current service. I wanna leave the majority of the time for questions, but I did wanna just kind of lay the table a little bit so that everyone understands why we are where we are. You know, we have 21 vessels, as you probably know. In the summer, we operate 19 of those, two because there isn't enough dry dock space or maintenance time to not to just take um, to run them all during the summer. We need two work done even in the summer. So in the summer, we we crew 19 vessels. In the spring and fall shoulder seasons, 18. And then in the winter, when we don't go to Sydney and Port Townsend, Coopville goes to one boat, 17. And, you know, your legislators have to work with the other 30 um, ferry legislators and then their colleagues from around the state to fund a transportation budget that not only includes ferries, which are definitely part of the marine highway and part of the state highway system, but also that budget has to pay for bridges in Yakima and roads in Spokane and facilities in Wenatchee. And so it's a balancing act. And it's a difficult thing in the past to say, well, we're gonna keep 19 vessels worth of crew going, even in the winter when you're only running 17. You know, none of us want a King Five expose saying, why are you paying two vessels worth of watches um, who aren't working in the, in the winter? So over time, the process that's come, that came forward was we would hire people in the spring for the deck in the engine room. They would be on call for as long as two years. In the summer, they would work super hard. They would work full time, often getting overtime, not only as we, we staffed two additional boats, but as people who were full time were taking vacation, other leave that we all do in the summer. So then in the fall, this time of year, when we went to fewer boats, they would get less hours. And you know, like probably me and most of you, you can't have a job that only that you're on call and not getting called much um, for part of it. And so we would lose those crew members who we trained and, and it was tough. Some of them would ask to be laid off. They'd go get a second job and then they come back in the spring, not having lost seniority, but others we lost. And that was kind of the, the paradigm we used. And then COVID hit, you know, we, we ran drastically reduced service last year, but we were able to crew it. And then this year, our first sign was in the spring of 2021, we went out to hire 16 oilers and we got three qualified candidates. And that was just the beginning of realizing that, that you know, what we've seen all around the country, that people were looking at work in different ways. 
where there's an international shortage of mariners and then COVID. You know, we were doing well like the rest of the country in the spring. And then with the Delta variant, it really started to impact our ability to crew our vessels. We had early on, you know, we've, we've lost two employees to COVID over the last couple of years. And early on in like April of, of 2020, we lost a ticket seller at Seattle's Coleman Dock and unfortunately her husband. And we decided to be very transparent early, you know, from the get go with our crews. If we had a positive case and we had to quarantine people, we let folks know. And for, you know, for the spring and early summer, there was just a few. And then every week we were seeing more people who had to who had COVID and had to quarantine, or if they weren't um, vaccinated, people who had to um, quarantine because they were in contact with them. And it really challenged our ability to crew our vessels, as you all know better than we do. And so then as we reached October and the governor's vaccine mandate, we simply didn't have the ability. Um, starting the day after Labor Day, we had put Seattle Bremerton on one boat service. But as we got into October, we, we canceled 341 sailings due to crewing from October 1st to 17th. And it just wasn't tenable. And what we heard from all of you was, at least make service reliable. We're frustrated, but at least if it's less service you can rely on, it's better. And since then, we only had, in the second half of, of October, we only had eight canceled sailings when we went to the alternative service plan. Um, we still are able to add service back on that alternative service plan on a daily basis. We have just drastically reduced number of canceled sailings, but that of course is on the backs of all of you that the service is more reliable, but it cannot sustain the types of service that you're depending on. And, you know, I, 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 it's really hard. And I know from talking to a lot of you that you see WSF folks as uncaring, as people who sit in Seattle and make decisions that affect your lives and don't care. And, you know, we are, we are fellow Washingtonians. We want to provide better service. When I read stories about parents who can't see their children because they have to leave so early for work in Bainbridge and get home late at night, um, about people who you know miss important engagements because they're waiting for it, or people in Kingston who, who's, you know, whose business are impacted because we have lines of traffic, it's, it's really heartbreaking and we, we wanna do better. So you know we're on this alternative plan and what we've said is that we're hiring. We didn't lay anybody off this year. We didn't let anyone go. Um, and so we are looking, we lost about 130, 140 people around the time of the mandate. Um, for the debt crew, it's fairly easy, you know, that um, we hire them. There are some basic requirements with the federal government, the Coast Guard and TSA to get credentialed. But for the engine room, it's tough. You know, people come from maritime academies or the Coast Guard or other mariners. But we are focused solely on hiring those folks, getting them trained, getting them into our job so we can increase service. Um, last week, 10 days ago, we were we a service restoration team met. They looked at service restoration and the San Juan Islands had just really been struggling. And I know, and not to minimize how all you all are struggling, but it was tough up there in the islands. So we started a trial restoration of service up there to fall service. It's going fairly well. We figure we need another week or so before we claim victory. And then we will go to Seattle, Bainbridge, then to Clinton Muckleteo, then to Edmonds Kingston, then the Triangle Route, um, Fauntleroy Southward Vashon, and then finally to Bremerton, Seattle Bremerton. Um, that is all, you know, it's based on need, it's based on ridership, and it's based on our ability to responsibly and reliably add service back. No one would like to just go back to the fall schedule more than um, Nicole and me, except maybe all of you. Um, but we have to do it in a way that we can ensure that reliable service we heard about so much from all of you. So I'll end with that. Nicole, I don't know if there's anything you want to add um, as chief of staff and someone who works on recruiting every day. But you know, for, for me, that's just explain the situation of where we are. Yeah, I appreciate that, John. And that's a, a great um, segue. And, um, I think we should probably get to the questions and I look forward to, I know there's questions that we won't be able to answer, but I look forward to hearing them and I know we'll, we'll respond um, later working with staff. Excellent. Well, our first question comes from Nancy. 
Uh, Nancy asks what the details of the federal infrastructure bill are to the ferry system, if we know that. Yeah. So, and I'm gonna steal part of Sandra Rolfus's answer for last week that was so good because she did a much better answer, job, of course, than I did answering it. But um, the, the federal infrastructure bill um, is very helpful for us with terminal electrification. As you may know, because of build in Washington, um, because um, by law, our boats have to be built in state, that means we can't get federal dollars for their construction. Um, we can get it for some things um, with, with upgrades and equipment on um, vessels we already have, but they, it can't be used for new construction. Um, there is money in the infrastructure package for, um, for terminal electrification, which is something we really need. Um, and then the majority of the ferry money in the federal package, um, as someone who's a um, native Alaskan, Sandra Murkowski um, got five pounds of flesh for her bipartisan vote on the infrastructure bill. And most of the ferry money is, is aimed at Alaska. But as Sandra Rolfe so rightfully pointed out last week, you know, the money that we are going to get and that is going to be spent on infrastructure all across the state, not just for ferries, that's money, that's state money that doesn't have to be spent on those projects. And there's going to be, you know, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars spent on those that frees up state funding for ferries and other transportation needs. Excellent. Our next question is from Mark. Since the planned delivery of replacement vessels has been delayed by the decision that new ferries must have electric propulsion, what is the feasibility and cost for one or more of the recently retired ferries to be repaired and returned to service? So um, I, I guess I just wanna back up on the premise a bit. Um, Vigor built four Olympic class ferries for WSF. Um, the legislature a couple of years ago extended that contract to build five more and working with the governor's office, they directed that those be hybrid electric. So we looked at it and nobody wanted them to be full electric because, you know, if there's a power outage or something, we want those two diesel engines so those boats can still run after an earthquake or an emergency. So they will be hybrid electric. Um, and that the, the manufacturer of the propulsion system for the first four that we had owned no longer exists. So we were going to have to upgrade the propulsion and change the propulsion system anyway. Um, and that, so instead of just doing four diesel engines, we're doing hybrid electric. So we are in the final process of working with um, the shipbuilder on updating the terms of the contract. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing. It's a, you know, it's us trying to be resourceful with state funds and it's a, it's a vendor who obviously wants to make money and build good boats um, following on the first four Olympics. So we have not sat down with them yet to, um, to negotiate a price. Um, we're trying to finish the contract and then we'll turn to that. Um, when that's done, then construction can begin. So, you know, I think to, the, to be specific to the um, questioner, I think it's unlikely we'll have any new vessels before early 2025. And that's dependent on us being able to move forward fairly quickly with, the, with getting the contract finished and the price negotiated. Excellent. Our next question comes from Jim. Uh, it's a two-parter. Why are the northern routes prioritized rather than the more traveled routes in the Mid-Sound? And in light of the recent, oh, sorry, uh, that is about the federal infrastructure, which we already answered, but uh, the first part of the question, why are the northern routes prioritized? Nicole, do you want to take that? Uh, sure. I mean, I think we're talking about the San Juan Islands. Um, and really, the, the San Juan Islands are islands. Um, they have no other means of, of driving around. Um, while the ridership might not be as great as it is on, say, Seattle Bainbridge, um, that's really why they are prioritized the highest. We do, um, they do need to reinstate reservations, so we have to have a reliable way in which to reinstate those reservations. I think that's what we're getting at. If I can interject for a minute, not everybody on this call 
will know about the prioritized reintroduction of service list that um, you all sent out. So could you, could one of you summarize kind of what the draft plan is for bringing back the service route by route? Uh, Nicole, do you want? <laughs> go ahead, John. Go ahead. Uh, um, so, um, so 10 days ago, we started a trial in the San Juan Islands restoring them to service, because as Nicole said, um, and again, neither Nicole nor I want to negate any of the impacts that are happening to all of you. We know they're severe, um, but it has been incredibly difficult. In the San Juans, they move school children by boat. Um, they have physicians who visit to do um, medical procedures by boat. Um, there's even things like a mobile slaughterhouse that hasn't been able to go up to, the, to Lopez and the islands to process meat. Um, they they were severely impacted and and you know when school children are have to, having to leave school early or not go at all because of our lack of service that's why we we restored them first um, I'm hoping in a week or two if if we can continue fairly reliable service there we go to Seattle Bainbridge obviously busiest um, commuter route when that is reliably done we'll go to Clinton Muckleteo then Edmonds Kingston then the Triangle, and then Seattle, Bain, or Seattle Bremerton. So it, 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 it definitely doesn't feel fair to the people, the good folks of Bremerton, um, but we're trying, you know, we're prioritizing reliability and the and ridership and need. And the, the um, Sydney run up in Anacortes will is not on this list and the second boat on Port Townsend um, Clinton is not on the list. So, um, it, so we, normally this time of year, Port Townsend Coopville will already be on one boat, so they aren't on the list. Um, and then we have announced that um, Anacorta Sydney, um, and I, I should say Port Townsend Coopville hasn't been on two boats for over a year. They didn't get their second boat all this year, which was certainly frustrating for them. And then um, we would still, we'd be doing one trip a day to Sydney usually right now, that's not on the list. In, from January till early April, late March, early April, that route doesn't run anyway. So, you know, we'll be looking and communicating with folks um, about service restoration there, you know, if and when we can closer to spring. Our next question comes from Mark. Uh, when will Friday and Saturday night late runs return? You know, that's one of the things that, um, you know, for those of you who don't know that we, um, across the Mid Sound, we canceled late night sailings during COVID because we were having difficulty crewing them. And there were, there were literally some um, rides that uh, would, would have three or four people on them. Um, one of the things we're looking at internally, and, and Nicole may um, be able to speak to this as well, is, you know, where, what is the value? Is, is it, if we can't restore a second boat right away, but we can increase the service hours, is that pre preferable? Um, you know, we know that that's a goal out there to get that back, but um, at the moment, you know, we're just having trouble crewing a basic schedule. So it definitely is something the service restoration team is looking at, but not something the timing on which we've decided yet. Our next question comes from Bruce. What is the ferry system doing to attract more employees and will the on-call requirement continue? Are the salaries competitive? That's you, Nicole. Yeah, that's me. Okay, um, as chief of staff, uh, the one thing I can't answer. Um, so uh, what we're actually doing is, is um, going for a recruiting firm to help us um, with our recruitment efforts. We have um, continuously been hiring, especially um, DEC. Um, we have we hired much later into the season than we've ever done. Uh, we are recruiting for our engine employees and our terminals right now on, on a typical manner. Um, I'm, I'm not a recruiter, uh, but what I can say is that um, we've gotten a lot of interest. I think um, perhaps the, the media that we've gotten because of not being able to crew our vessels um, and we're missing service, a lot of attention. So we have had some more people apply, which is very encouraging. Um, regarding the on-call question, um, that is exactly something we are looking into right now. 
the governor's office um, is very, um, well, pretty adamant in the fact that we need to keep our employees gainfully employed through the slower times of the season. And so we're uh, actively coming up with, with ideas on how to, to do that, whether it's overstaffed vessels, whether it's additional training and, and relieving folks to, to attend that training, um, whether it's doing some maintenance on vessels, such as painting and what, whatnot in the off season, uh, when the crews aren't as needed, as John mentioned, the number of vessels um, we require to sail in the off season um, is reduced. So um, these are definitely ideas that we're, we're working with the governor's office um, to, to fund. Our next question comes from Jacob. Uh, is there any consideration being made to encourage new passenger only ferry options for routes not currently served by such, such as Bainbridge, this would encourage carless travel and address capacity service needs, potentially with lower cost and more readily available vessels. So uh, WSF is precluded by state law from running passenger only service. We can only run the, the vehicle passenger mix that we have. Um, that's why you see county folks um, voting to tax themselves to do passenger only service. Um, you know, one of the things that your delegation, um, Senator Rolfus and representatives um, Han Simmons have been great about is really not pushing us, but encouraging us to work more closely with Kitsap Transit on how we can increase, um, increase that service, especially at times when our boats aren't running. But it would be up to Bainbridge folks and, and Kitsap County residents to, to begin passenger only service to, to Bainbridge. It's not something um, under current law that we could do. Our next question comes from David. Uh, it's a bit long. For the last few weeks, the Bainbridge run has been mostly on two boats. Do you anticipate any more interruptions? Also, especially on days when we are limited to one boat, have you considered people directing traffic in Seattle to help with the unload? The construction on Alaskan Way has really slowed down the unloading process. Um, so, when we released the alternative service plan in October, we said that you know we are going to this plan, but that we would um, crew boats on a daily basis where we could. And you know, so far, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves um, because I know it's you all who feel the pain. Even though we've in, we've increased service in the San Juans, on most days we have been able to add additional service on Seattle, um, Seattle Bainbridge, Edmonds Kingston, and Clinton Muckleteo. Um, that is partly because we signed MOUs, Memorandums of Understanding, with our labor partners who've been really good through this process that allow us to move crews who are on boats having maintenance done to cover other, um, to cover up to service elsewhere. You know, it's a little bit more complicated than like a road crew and like, oh, we'll just shift people around to different regions because our employees have to have Coast Guard certification on different vessels. So sometimes there's a glitch because we have a crew member, but he or she isn't certified to work on a boat that we're trying to run. But, you know, so the, the short answer is there may be future service disruptions. Um, Seattle Bainbridge is definitely a priority and one that we try to do. Um, and then to Coleman, again, probably only you all would be more happy than we are um, in a month or so when Marion Street reopens and we have two exits at Coleman Dock is, and, and that current constraint is the city of Seattle doing work along the waterfront, it's not us. We know having that, um, that one boat is difficult. Um, to traffic control, that one exit is difficult. To traffic control specifically, um, you know, this is something the good folks in Kingston know all too well. Um, Washington State Patrol has told us a couple of years ago, after several years, they would no longer help us with traffic control, even though we were having to pay them for it. Um, the city, Seattle um, police have also told us that they aren't interested um, in helping with traffic control. So we contract with someone, with a company who hires off-duty officers to provide traffic control. Um, you know, we, we, look at, um, we look at Kingston, Muckleteo, Fauntleroy. Um, I, it has been challenging because they're having the same workforce challenges that we all do. It's been difficult to get um, traffic control everywhere, 
but I will write that down that, you know, on both on that, you know, we need to continue looking at that where we can at Coleman Dock in Seattle. Excellent. Our next question is from Elena. When can we expect jumbo ferries to be assigned to both positions on the Edmonds Kingston schedule? So Elena, thanks for that question. And, and, you know, Elena is a new chair of the Kingston Ferry Advisory Committee. And just to put a plug in, because as I said in my introduction, I, I am the liaison for WSF to our 13 ferry advisory committees. And the, the Bainbridge, you know, there's four in Kitsap. Four of 13 are from your county. And um, Kingston and um, Bainbridge have terrific members of their ferry advisory committees. You can find their contact information on our website. And they're, they're really good resources as well as your legislators for letting us know. Um, you know, Alina, actually, I, I'm gonna drop in some information um, with this. So as you may know, the Wenatchee in late April, um, while, um, while doing tests after service, um, experienced an engine room fire, it has been out for several months. We hope to get that back at the end of December. Um, and that will that was give us some flexibility to get you bigger boats. I do want to say, um, and you know, we're going to announce this more in, tomorrow probably. Um, we're focused on crewing constraints because that's a problem. But you know, as the gentleman who at the beginning asked about new boats, we still we are at 21 boats right now, down from 24 three years ago. The Wenatchee's out because of the fire. The Tokate is out with some unexpected maintenance work. So that's put us down to 19. We have to continually do maintenance work. So in two weeks, um, the 15th and 16th of December, whether or not we have crew, we are not gonna have enough boats to crew every route. So what we're gonna do, um, we have to take a boat off um, the triangle route. We can't leave them with only one boat serving Vashon Island. So we're gonna move um, the boat from the Seattle Bremerton route over to the Triangle, and then move the Caliton from um, from Ed from Edmonds Kingston over to be the only boat on Bremerton. So for two days, longer if the maintenance takes longer than we expect, Edmonds Kingston will be on one boat service on the 15th and 16th, because you know literally we have nowhere else to go. Um, Seattle Bremerton is already on one boat. The triangle's on two. We can't leave them with zero or one. And then again, looking at ridership and need, Seattle Bainbridge and Clinton Muckleteo have heavier ridership. And so it's going to fall to Edmonds Kingston to take the, the brunt of those two days. And we have reached out to the traffic control company I talked about to make sure we have traffic control for those two days. Um, but you know, it, it it just reinforces what someone was asking about earlier. This isn't just a crewing constraint, it's also vessels. Um, so Alina, to your question, we're gonna get you bigger boats back as soon as we can. Um, but for now, we still have significant constraints with boats out unexpectedly. Our next question comes from Kimberly. Why in adopting an alternate schedule for Seattle Bainbridge, did you choose to cancel the vessel that carries the most number of passage passengers uh, that would be leaving Bainbridge at 7.05 a.m. and leaving Seattle at 4.45 p.m. Nicole, I think it's it's based on the, the size of the vessel we can crew, right? It, everything comes back to crewing. You know, it, I, I can't answer that question. Um, I don't believe it had to do with crewing, um, but possibly um, the, um, is it the number one or the number two vessel that is the Murray vessel. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't answer. Yeah, that. let's get, one. we'll get back to yeah. you on that. Excellent, our next question is from Zach. Has there been any thought on giving Kitsap residents a discount, for example, charging winter fares throughout the year as a way to offset service disruption impacts to residents' day-to-day -day commutes and logistics? Um, so, just a very quick explanation of, of our budget process. So um, every two years, the legislature passes an amount of money that has to be made um, through fares for WSF. And you know, a lot of transit agencies get have a 20, 25% fare box recovery. 
But because again, going back to what I said at the beginning, the, the need, the extensive needs for transportation funding in this state, our riders pay 75 to 80 per, 75 to 80% of our operating costs. The rest of that, 20 to 25%, and almost 100% of capital needs. So that's the maintenance on the vessels, also new vessels that are a couple of hundred million dollars each. That's paid by the taxpayers of, of Washington. So, um, so we, the legislature passes that amount. We don't set the fares. That goes to the Washington State Transportation Commission, who then works out, you know, are they going to charge people who in vehicles more? Are they going to charge walk-ons? Are they going to balance that? Um, so that is um, a decision they make um, because that is not something that's negotiable. And you know, Senator Rolfus and I, she called me last year um, during COVID to talk about exactly that and about, you know, to be honest, how tone deaf it looked to um, to raise fares on people who were, you know, at that time only traveling for very essential reasons. Um, but we had to follow that legislative direction from transportation committee members and, and, and raise those fares. It, it, as recently as today, though, um, Senator Rolf has brought up that, you know, we need to look at with the legislature um, some relief for our passengers who are paying full service and getting half service basically. And so, you know, those are definitely conversations we'll be having um, and looking to see if there is any um, leeway there. I will say, you know, having worked on this budget for a long time, um, it, if, if, if the fares go down, then that's funding that comes from somewhere else. And, you know, it's our, all part of the whole. And with the state already paying 20 to 25% of our operating costs, um, you know, I know that transportation committee leaders often hear from people on the other side of the state who are helping to, to pay for your part of the highway. In the same way, of course, your taxes are helping to build bridges and roads on the other side of the, high, of the state. Our next question comes from Evan. Why do we keep the made in Washington law when we've lost most of our boat yards and they're owned by out of state companies? John, do you want me to take that because that's that was a legislative decision, not a ferries decision? Sure, and I might have something to add on at the end, but yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, I was in the legislature during the recession when the Obama administration sent out federal money and we couldn't use it for the ferry system because you can't use federal funds if you have restrictive language that precludes interstate commerce. Um, and so at that time, 2011 or so, we looked at getting rid of the build in Washington rules. We've had them, I'm, I'm going to say for t at least 20, maybe 30 years at this point. The reason is purely political. Um, I'll just say that. Um, it Having the jobs in the local shipyards helps get support for ferry capital construction. And that is the main reason that that clause is there. Um, secondly, as frustrating as that is, the experience that ferries had um, before any of us were in office was with a shipyard in the Gulf, one of the Gulf states was that the, the ferries came in and then needed very expensive retrofitting because they hadn't been made to um, spec. So, um, that's kind of a long reason for that. What we found during the um, Obama infrastructure bills and what we'll end up doing again, I'm confident with the Biden um, funds is that we can shuffle money around. So we can use federal funds for terminals, for electrification, um, for parts of the boat that may not be made in Washington, like, I don't know, elevators, for example. Um, there's ways to use federal infrastructure dollars to help the ferry system, even with the boats being um, having that made in Washington designation. Yeah, Senator, thanks for that. And, and I believe there was a study conducted two years ago that showed that it was basically a wash, that if you did away with this, as you said, um, the boats would be cheaper, but all the money spent on plum plumbers and pipe fitters and steel workers would be spent in Louisiana and other places, not in Washington's economy. So it, it just is basically a wash on where you build them. 
Yeah, and that I forgot to mention that as well. Our next question comes from Al. How much do we spend a year on maintenance and can we have our own maintenance department? Nicole, I'm not sure on how much we spend, but um, we, so we have, um, as those of you in Bainbridge know, we have the Eagle Harbor Maintenance Facility. Um, they are there, um, is Nicole, I think it's a $5 million cap. There's a cap on how much we can do um, ourselves, because again, um, people don't want the state competing with um, private business. So there's um, a lot of the work um, we don't have, the state doesn't own a dry dock. So any dry dock work, the really extensive work that needs to be done on vessels um, is done at a commercial shipyard. Um, but other work is, just, is done there at Bainbridge. Um, also the folks at the Bainbridge facility, they maintain our terminals. So if, if something goes out, um, you know, if a transfer span or overhead loading or something breaks, um, people from Eagle Harbor are also dispatched to take care of that. Um, so we do do a lot of the work in-house, but there is that financial threshold at which it's been decided we won't do it. We will contract that out to, um, to allow, you know, a robust um, marine repair businesses to, to survive in Washington state. Excellent. Our next question comes from Jim. Can the city of Bainbridge slash the county slash the state and federal government and Kid Stop Transit combine resources to make the Bainbridge terminal into a transit center, including concession contracts for vendors, park and ride facilities slash charging stations to help reduce individual drivers and promote less carbon emissions and environmental safety? That's a great question. And, you know, we work closely with, um, with Kitsap Transit on, you know, aligning, um, aligning, you know, transit if we're changing things. Um, there will be some work next year that you all hear about um, at the Bainbridge Terminal to, um, to do some work on overhead loading and, and at the terminal. Um, we have a, um, you know, we, we, there are a lot of terminals that need work. We prioritize them based um, on need, especially seismic need. Um, you know, we've just done Seattle and Mukilteo. The next one we're turning to is, um, is Fauntleroy, which because of climate change and sea level rise and um, seismically, it is not safe. It, um, the sea level's rising, it's not high enough. So we need to, to upgrade that terminal. Um, there are certainly things we do um, at Bainbridge. And like I said, you'll be hearing um, about work we're going to do there next year. Um, but Nicole, I, I, I know you got pushed off, but the question was asking about, you know, coordinating on like making a multimodal transit center. And I know that we work with Kitsap County on those things, but I don't know of any specific plans to upgrade that part of the facility. Are we talking Bainbridge or are we talking about? Bainbridge. Bainbridge, right. Um, so right now, uh, there has not been any plans, um, but I do, since this question came up earlier about passenger only, I do want to point out that in, at Coleman Dock, and sorry if you said this already, I did get booted. Um, Coleman Dock, we designed and built um, the facility for King County. They paid for that. Um, on Vashon Island, we own the facility and, and King County uh, leases from us. At Southworth, we worked with Kitsap Transit and established an agreement so that they can use our slip at Southworth to operate passenger only. Um, and then we're looking to do the same thing at Bremerton. Uh, nothing right now uh, with Bainbridge. It usually starts with um, the passenger only operators approaching us for that need. And um, that hasn't happened yet, but we're always willing to, to work with our passenger only partners. Excellent. Our next question comes from Robert. Many states offer discounts for island residents, for example, Maine and Massachusetts. I'm suggesting an income opportunity. Washington state residents could buy ticket books of 10 to 20 with no expiration date ahead of travel. This is for residents who do not get discounts from employers. Washington state gets money ahead and tourists effectively would pay 15 or more above that rate. That's a win for local riders in the states. Uh, is that something you've considered? 
So, you know, it, you won't be surprised to hear, especially in the San Juan Islands, we, um, and, you know, other island communities, we hear about um, local preference. And, you know, if you are literally reliant on the ferries to get to work or, um, or for medical appointments, why shouldn't you be able to um, have priority um, for reservations or for loading? Um, under current state law, it, our services first come first serve. We cannot prioritize. And, and I think the questioner asked it in a really smart way because part of that is you may not, you know, your driver's license may say Wenatchee or um, Spokane, but you may own a house in the San Juan Islands or you may own a business in Bainbridge. And so it puts our employees on the, um, in the position of having to judge whether or not and, you know, and we know that there are also people who own homes in Washington who live in other states. So, you know, we, we cannot prioritize based on residency because it puts our toll booth people or our customer service folks in the position of judging who is and isn't, uh, who is and is not a resident. Um, you know, it, it, that could certainly change, but it would be very difficult um, to prioritize. We do have the multi-ride packs. Um, and again, I think the questioner was really smart. They do have expiration dates, and that's because we have this requirement I talked about a few minutes ago to raise a certain amount of money um, from fares. And so we give that break for people, especially during the summer surcharge for, for, um, for frequent riders to do it. But there is that expiration because they aren't meant to be used you know, in three years when fares may have gone up. Um, they're used to be, they're made to be used in the short term as a break for our, our frequent riders. Um, and that's just not something with the, the fare box recovery responsibilities we have that we can change. Uh, I, I popped in, Peter, if I can just ask, that's a question that comes up a lot. And I know during the peak of COVID, we were able to turn in our, um, frequent rider cards, there, there was a little bit of a reimbursement in there so that you didn't get stuck, especially with those expensive car ones. Um, that is something I'd, I'd really like to take a look at. So I'm saying that because this is a town hall and we're legislators. Um, and I'd like to see how, if, what kind of decline in sales we've been seeing on the frequent rider cards. And if maybe there is a revenue um, a revenue opportunity there by extending the expiration date or or making it an annual, you know, extend expire at the end of the year, something like that. Because um, we know people aren't co going across as much as they used to, but they're still going across often. And Sandra, thanks for saying that. We, we still have that amnesty for folks because we know you, you can't punish people, right, for not providing service so they can get to where they need to go and then saying, um, we looked into just extending it and, and we just, IT um, logistics wise, did not have the ability to extend it out. Um, and of course, what you're saying is we could just change the whole system. But for what we have now, we couldn't. But we are just, you know, there's sort of an amnesty. If people want to um, trade in, they get a refund for the unused portion. Um, along those lines, our next question comes from Martha. Can we reduce the percentage that is required to be obtained from ferry riders? How does that compare with the percentage required from drivers in the eastern part of the state on a cost per mile basis, for example? Isn't the ferry more efficient per vehicle? That's a great question, Martha. Um, so, you know, as I said in my remarks earlier, our fare box recovery is much higher than other transportation, um, but you know, there are costs associated with it. Um, that is something the Transportation Committee could look at. But for every decrease transportation revenue from our passengers, that money has to be made uh, somewhere else. Um, I don't know the figures or the comparison to, um, to road users. You know, one of the things, and, and the legislators can speak to this better than I can, but one of the real challenges that the state faces um, is the gas taxes are significantly decreasing. And those of you around a long time know that until 1999, um, WSF had a, de a dedicated line of funding and when Tim Iman's I, um, initiative 695 passed, we lost that funding overnight and there were drastic you know, cuts in service, there was um, increased fares and the legislature did just 
you know, incredible work trying to stabilize our system, coming up with a level of service um, that they all agreed was, was, you know, required and necessary for their constituents. Um, but it has been a struggle to fund ferries ever since then. And you know, despite the good work of your legislators who, you know, seriously are at this every day during session and, and talking to us all during the year, um, they are competing for those transportation dollars with other parts of the state and it's a challenge. Excellent. Our next question comes from Evan. Rather than laying off crew in slow months, have you used some of that time to cross train people for other boats? Nicole, do you want to take that? Sure. That, you know, that's a, um, exactly what we're doing. Um, we're doing that now. We have, we're putting a plan together to make sure that our crews are more interchangeable than, than they have been in the past. Um, and that is definitely something that we're, we're asking for money to do. Um, moving forward, we, we do have to have more crews um, that's specifically uh, with relationship to the engine crews, and we do need to have more of them before we can start doubling up and training them on other vessels. Um, but definitely, it's a great, great plan, and, and we're, that's what something we're doing. Excellent. Our next question comes from Martha. If the Washington State Ferries are part of the state transportation system, why isn't WashDOT required to assist with moving cars at the terminal? So we're part of WASDOT. It's, it's one WASDOT, WSF's part of that. And so their part of our budget is, um, or our part of the overall budget is that terminal crewing. So, um, or, you know, we have, we have staff there who are working, you know, every day hard to, to move the, the cars. Um, I guess I don't completely understand the question because you know we are moving them as as well as we can. We have the terminal staff there to do that, and I'm not sure what WASDOT, you know, as a bigger entity that we're part of, um, could do to to help us more with that. I think that to help with that response, I want to point out Martha used to be the chair of the Bainbridge Ferry Advisory Committee, Martha Burke. So she um, has been following and tracking ferry issues for years. I think that her question was typed in when we were talking about the mess at Coleman and the frustration with State Patrol and the city of Seattle not helping. And it's valid. We've been um, pushing on that. Legislators have been pushing on that for years in Seattle, and but we just can't. We can't make Seattle DOT um, pay attention. Uh, so that maybe that's a another thing for us to take up. But hopefully, when the Marion Street um, opening gets gets going again, we'll have some of those problems sorted out anyway. Senator, that's super helpful context. Thank you, and and Martha. Um, WASDOT doesn't, you know, part of the thing that we've struggled with is we can't put our terminal employees who are not trained, you know, we have, en we have enough terminal employees to run the terminal. They are not trained to, to, to direct traffic. And so we have to default to traffic um, control officers. Um, even if we train them, they are not law enforcement. They can't ticket anyone, they can't do anything. And, and we're reluctant to put people in harm's way. Um, you know, it is, a couple of years ago, right before COVID, someone pulled a gun on a line cutter at Fauntleroy. Um, you know, we have angry people out there and, you know, we, we want to have uniformed law enforcement out there who can do that job rather than um, WASDOT staff who, are, you know, are not trained in the same way. Um, you know, they do road work, but they don't do that kind of traffic control at terminals. All right, I, one final question from Doug. Uh, State Route 305's proposed modifications will result in long queues causing slow access to the Bainbridge Ferry Terminal. Have you considered using adaptive traffic control traffic signals as a solution at the Port Madison Road and Agate Wood Road areas? You know, that under the one WASDOT thing, Nicole, I don't know if yeah. you know, I mean, that's more of a WASDOT than a WSF thing. Um, but, yes. you know, Nicole is a former terminal person, do you know? Um, I, I do not, but um, um, that is something definitely we can pass along to our, our DOT uh, brothers and sisters in the Olympic region. Good comment.
Excellent. I think that is all the time we have for questions. If we want to move on now to closing remarks, I will turn the floor over uh, to John. Yeah, I just, you know, again, thank you all for your questions and for your time this evening. Um, you know, again, as I said, we are not um, immune to the pain you're feeling. We, we don't feel it in the same way and I don't wanna pretend we do but we are people who care and, and wanna provide better service and we're focused on that. Um, so thank you again for your time. Um, I'll just mention that early next month, um, we will be holding with, um, with the Assistant Secretary for Ferries, Nicole and the other um, directors. Um, we'll do, twice a year we do public meetings. So in early January, when the governor's budget comes out, we have a better idea of what's there. Um, and just as the legislative session starts and legislators start working on our budget, um, we will do public meetings, um, likely one at noontime and one in the evening virtually. So look for those and another opportunity to ask questions and hear from WSF management. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Senator and representatives for inviting us. Hey, and I think I'm next on the designated order. Um, thanks everyone for your great questions. I don't have much to add, right? I mean, I think we're on the way towards getting this immediate crisis behind us, but you know, there's a lot to do. So thanks for being here. Um, I got to jump to a 6.30 meeting. I'm sorry, farewell. Yeah, and I'll just close and say, you know, thank you all for being here as well. And if you have further questions, you can always reach out to my office and Zach Ellis is my legislative assistant and can connect us, connect you to John. Um, John is very responsive. We're so, I'm so grateful to have a good partner in John that um, even through these really hard times and you know, none of us are enjoying um, you know, seeing what's happening around um, our district with the ferries, but John is very responsive to our constituents and will always give you an answer, um, whether that's uh, positive or, or not. Um, we are working really hard and preparing for this upcoming session to organize our, the, all of the ferry legislators to be a powerful voice and fight for the the funding that we need to fix these issues. So please reach out to my office, tara.simmons at ledge.wa.gov, and Zach will connect you with John if you have uh, additional questions. Thank you, Tara. And I will close us out for the evening. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Ferries, Nicole, and John for being here and taking these questions. And um, I'm gonna speak on behalf of Drew and Tara. We will be starting our legislative session again in January and fighting for the ferry system, restoring our service and getting the capital construction dollars um, so that we have a stable, reliable service over the next decade is gonna be a high priority for us. And we're already working in partnership with ferry legislators from around Puget Sound. So please stay in touch with us. We all live here too, we know this stinks and um, we'll be fighting and pushing and urging and providing input all along the way. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm gonna close us out. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.